Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CDCT live session. I'm Jason Rader, and I'll be your host. Today's topic is on securing containers and the environment. Uh, with me today, we have Victor Aranda, Principal Architect, and Chase Christensen, a Solutions Architect, here working with us at CDCT. Good morning and welcome, gentlemen. Morning. Hello. So, a lively topic on containers and security today, I am sure we will have. Um, but let's let's kind of set the stage for the folks listening out there. Why are we here? What containers? Chase, why don't you kick us, kick us off with telling us about the, how the market has embraced containers? Yeah. So, I mean, I, what I've been looking to to see how the market really embraces containers is I kind of look at what the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, who they're kind of curators for Kubernetes. They they claim that they're this. Well, they they are. They're really a vendor agnostic source for Linux and containers. They're a subset of the Linux Foundation, right? And so they do these yearly surveys. They talk about you know what do they see from people that are interested in containers and how they're adopting them more, right? So they say that they had a ninety two percent increase in containers. And they're also claiming there's a 14 trillion uh, market cap investment from the private sector into these open source, right? These are open source projects they're discussing, as well as um, a $14 billion um, market. That's what they're claiming. That's a lot of trillions and billions that we're talking about there. So I think it's safe to say that uh, containers are ingrained into, or the, the plan is for them to be ingrained into the environment at, at this point. What do you think about that, Victor? I wouldn't be shocked to see uh, container deployments of applications as prevalent as, as virtualized applications at this point, <clears throat> where you have folks accustomed to being able to just go out and download an OVA and then spin up a, you know, an application. You, you know, container registries, I think, are going to be the new version of that, where anyone can go over and just you know spin up a, a version of an application. And then that's part of the power of, of that platform. It's also part of the vulnerabilities and the, you know, the weaknesses. And so that's part of what we'll talk about today is <clears throat> a lot of the new and old security problems that, that affect containers. And, uh, and, you know, how do you, how do you take these older or not you know, this traditional security concepts and apply them to this new paradigm? And it's not actually a new paradigm. I mean, I've, you know, most people know containers have been around for a long time. It's only the prevalence that has, uh, has changed recently and uh, some of the orchestration. So why is that? I mean, before, I love the segue into the security side, but just why do you think it's, uh, you made a bold statement that they'll be as prevalent as, you know, somebody using an OVA file or something along those lines. So what, what happened? What, what changed that made it easier? You know, I, I think it's a combination of uh, scalability and <clears throat> the ability to, to kind of limit the deployment of, of resources um, towards an application. So you can, you know, compartmentalize the components of what they call microservices down to a smaller, you know, uh, pro footprint or profile instead of having monolithic virtual machines doing everything or a um, bunch of different services that are running all in the same kernel, all that can talk to each other on the same application, on the same server. This is a, a means of segmentation and a means of portability, most importantly, and, uh, and also scalability. So the ability to just take a container from one image or an image from from you know running on one one set of infrastructure and then move it over to completely different you know infrastructure. Uh, I think is pretty powerful. Jace, want to build on that a little bit? I'm coming at yeah. this from a security standpoint, uh, security engineer standpoint, right? Right. Well, no, I I absolutely agree. Right. So this is there's this conversation about. Um, we're really used to hardware being virtualized, right? We have this hardware, right? We needed to say, hey, we want to share this with more than one OS. So that's where the VM came. Well, now we're actually trying to take the application and instead of having it exist within a monolithic, you know, server, we want to spread it across your network. And then we are virtualizing the processes. So we're focusing on sharing the kernel versus just sharing that hardware. So it's like another level of efficiency, um, in which case you can start to make agility, agility and resiliency plays, having smaller teams and all that jazz, but that is powered by these technologies living within these containers and then orchestrated um, by something like Kubernetes. Love it. No, that's, that's great. I think that's a good description, guys. So is the vulnerability or the, the, the risk here of folks approaching container containerized environments from a security perspective the same way that they've approached security before? Is that one of the issues that we're looking at? Yes and no. Uh, I would say that a lot of the problems or the challenges that people face are the same problems or challenges that we've faced in a general sense since, you know, 
security and, and, and IT kind of kicked off. And those are things like role-based access control, um, least privilege concepts, um, logging and visibility, um, having proper governance, having proper training and procedures, um, keeping up to date with your software, a track of your vulnerabilities. I mean, I, I could have said those things and been talking about you know, anything. practically anything, right? <laughs> yeah. And and so the difference with with uh, containerization is that you have a sort of a new set of attack surfaces. You have an orchestration layer. You have uh, you know the potential for um, you know kernel access in a container. Um, there's because it's so new. You have the governance and the training and the familiarity problems that right. exacerbate all these other things, and you get people who are you know maybe a little bit ahead of themselves getting things set up in a way that isn't uh, necessarily ideal or secure and they get into trouble. But really there's not a whole lot that is fundamentally new here. It's a lot of the same, you know, same concepts, same practices, same advice, but just applied in this, in this particular context. No, I like that. So let's, let's start with kind of the orchestration layer that you mentioned. Um, so when we're talking about that, we're talking about Kubernetes in, in most of the situations, right? So what are some of the new elements? Because I think also who would, I think one of the things that you kind of alluded to, Victor, is that, you know, let's say we're using this new paradigm within our organization. It's typically the same guys that are in charge of securing it or managing it or operating it. Uh, but some other folks were kind of the catalyst behind what pushed the initiative, right? So the, the, the devs wanted this because from an efficiency perspective, let's say that's how it, it worked. I know that isn't how it always works. Um, but now we've got some guys that um, are not necessarily used to the orchestration layer paradigm, the container paradigm, the whole workflow that needs to happen uh, to instantiate as well as to operate this stuff. Uh, what are some of the things that are different about having an orchestration layer in this that would be different than from a virtualization you know, perspective? When you talk about uh, container security, it's not just the orchestration layer. You, you've got to talk about the actual container side of things, the the compliance and and repos or uh, and registry and uh, you know what's the content of the con of the container. You have to talk about um, network and uh, and host security. So the the orchestration layer, being you know Kubernetes in this context or this this mm -hmm. example, is just one of those things, and it excel itself has vulnerabilities or has uh, not really vulnerabilities but concerns, security issues that if not addressed can uh, can lead to you know increases in attack surface and risk. Uh, so <clears throat> just to differentiate between the two, you know, container security as a topic includes lots of different things from build to runtime um, and also the data security that underlies, you know, whatever the, the application is running on. <clears throat> the Kubernetes side of things has, a, has, you know, its own set of concerns as well. Um, and I'll tap Chase on that just it's easy, the resident expert in this call. Well, I, abs I absolutely agree, right? I think even before you start talking about deploying Kubernetes, you need to kind of s discuss things that, you know, that we know, which is we know that we need to pull these container images. And we know these need to live on a Linux host, right? So that's where these are back and user control and who has access to what, what we're pulling from where comes into play. And, you know, the, the thing that happened here, and if it, depending on how much of kind of the SRE, site reliability engineering Kool-Aid here that you drink, is that there was kind of two worlds. You had your development world, you had your operations world, and now they're kind of clashing heads. And there's Kubernetes, right? Which is like, it's very infrastructure-like in that you're spinning up networks and you've got these containers and these applications, but you also are giving your developers unvetted sometimes, well, hopefully vetted, you know, limited access to, but you got to decide that where that those boundaries are, right? Yeah. So you have these developers that want this agility and this ability to grab images, base images, and, you know, develop upon them. But you also want to make sure that they're playing within your boundaries. And so it's kind of these two worlds that Kubernetes tends to be where they, they really interact with each other. Yeah, if cloud um, IaaS services, the infrastructure as a services, um, Sort of exacerbated the shadow IT problem when they when they first started to arrive on the scene. This is a whole new layer of shadow IT where you mm -hmm. know the visibility from a traditional IT team, especially when it's not up to speed on on the technology, is is really you know lacking potentially <clears throat> an ability for a for a developer to just go out and start deploying stuff uh, without even having to ask for a virtual machine or that kind of thing. It's, is worrying as someone who came from operations and dealt with these sorts of issues in the past, that you did what? Mm -hmm. You pulled from where? Okay. Right. It's been running for six months. 
Absolutely. <laughs> and I think, you know, that's a, a good point. So are, do you feel that more folks, you know, because we talked about the tipping point aspects of this, right? There's a lot of early adopters on this that are making it, you know, some are very notable and making it look easy and like the yeah. right way to go. And then there are people that want a piece of that, right? Oh, oh this seems like a good solution. Uh, and then you get, I think, the environment that you were talking about, uh, referring to just a minute ago, Victor is like, oh, well, now we've got devs that are that are doing it and we'll catch up, right? Or or somebody in ops is like, all right, I'll hand the keys over to you because you know what you need, you get it done, and then we'll come back and we'll fix it later, but later never happens. <laughs> uh, and then, so do you think there's a lot of that that's going on do you, out in yeah. the world today? All right. I think there's a greater dichotomy between um, the folks who are on the leading edge, bleeding edge, PhDs, and people who could be teaching all of us, you know, uh, forever at level 500, right? On uh, on the, those are the SREs working at, at Google and and the pros and so on, uh, the developers who have built the applications. And then on <clears throat> the other side of the spectrum, there's the people who have, you know, don't know what a container is. Where I think the transition to virtualization was a little more, a bit more gradual, and you had more sure. of a you know yeah. bell curve population kind of moving along and understanding and then adopting and improving their their skill sets. This I think there's more of a, a you know a separation between the two between the these people have it figured out and they know what they're doing, you know they are the scientists, and then there's everyone else, right? So um, again, that goes back to having you know governance and and, and training. Uh, the, you know, the ability to shoot yourself in the foot here, I think, is uh, is greater than it was before. I, I mean, it's interesting that you should mention that because I am seeing that just even with discussing with our partners, right? Everyone's got a different way that they want to bring Kubernetes to the table, and there's these problems with Kubernetes, right? And um, it, you know, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, they actually had a survey and the top two issues with adopting containers and Kubernetes are complexity and cultural changes, right? And when you say complexity, right? If you're, if you're trying to develop IT solutions, that's money, that's gold. You're like, oh, I wanna solve for that complexity. So we often have these conversations with our partners and they're saying, we've solved this storage virtualization problem. We solved these other issues. So I think that there is still a little bit of a space race here where people are bumping elbows and trying to determine what's the best way to do things. And I think that as you start to have that conversation, it's really interesting because, you know, everyone still kind of has their crusade and you can dive into the whys and how many whys can you go into, you know, why is this the best practice? Is this just something that you see works for you from a management standpoint, or is this really the best in breed and this is how everyone should do it, which of course yeah. is kind of what they're all trying to do. And, and so. being a nascent uh, area of technology, there's, there's significant change even quarter to quarter. Uh, with either advisories that that come out or new practices or, or tech, especially technology mm -hmm. partners yeah. acquisitions in that space that are constantly kind of changing the landscape as we go and uh, as consultants you're going to have to keep up with as much of that as you can you know drink the drink the fire hose or put your mouth in front of it until you can't stand it anymore uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know this time next year there's going to be something completely uh, new to discuss about this for sure at least right if not multiple um, also want to point out that uh, there's because of the way containers are deployed and this might be a little bit of a segue um, the 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 recent supply chain attack on um, on customers using solar winds is a, a prime example of how you know grabbing software off of the internet um, especially you know if it's someone who's not necessarily uh, aware of what they're doing or security minded in, in doing that it can cause cause issues. I mean, what you saw is that, you know, pen penetrating one organization and getting into their CICD process and, and um, you know, injecting your, mal your malware, your software into their, into their releases affected right. thousands and thousands of customers. You get into a, you know, popular registry and, and, you know, sneakily add yourself in, you could find yourself in the same, in the same, um, you know, position, the same access to a lot of different uh, sensitive organizations. So I think we'll see the increased, um, emphasis on supply chain, on compliance, and on source control for, for, for registries and container images. That's a great segue. Yeah. Absolutely. I hadn't even, yeah, thought about that. But I think you brought up an interesting, you know, angle. I think, you know, that whole CICD pipeline that we're talking about, I mean, definitely from a security perspective, I mean, even not even talking about containers, but I know typically those things go hand in hand there's a security aspect that we're still trying to help people kind of ingest from a cultural perspective related to that. Because again, security kind of having the reputation of being the department of no, in a lot of cases, um, 
has has kept the devs almost like trying to work around that so that they can get their job done. Um, and I see. I, I think a lot of the times we're talking to, to clients, we're we're kind of the folks that are being the ambassadors between the two to try to hey, you guys and you guys want to do the right thing. Here's how you kind of do it together. It, that goes back to the previous conversation about um, about the level of of sophistication of of sure. each organization. Sure. <clears throat> so if we cast this conversation, cast this this example in in light of you know a traditional IT shop with a traditional infosec shop and a developer who wants to run containerized applications, okay. that is one set of challenges and conversations that happens, and that's a lot different than a startup or a small company that's very agile that is deploying natively and whose IT staff is effectively the developers and whose security folks are hopefully also at least in, you know involved in the development yeah. and it becomes less of a purview and um you know roles and responsibilities negotiation and these guys are doing this thing that i said that they couldn't do it becomes more of a you know i think conducive to progress and and uh an improvement and improves the uh the outcome by having it kind of be one cohesive team that speaks again to the cultural change that has to happen or rather the cultural change that i think enables uh adoption in in that you know it should be part of the build process from the very beginning that we're, you know, we're not addressing these things from, from the right side, we're shifting left. We're, we're trying to get ahead of the problems before they start. We're trying to build security in and, and limit access and reduce attack surface from the development side, not from the, you know, after effects, I mean, firewalls and stuff, although that's still important, right? Sure. But anyway, no, I think yeah. it, it kind of circles us back to the original, you know, numbers that chase throughout is you know, I think that's why because of the the shift that's got to take place I think that's why there's such a big investment and gifts into the the you know cloud native community if you will because these guys want to educate organizations it's more than just the tech it's it takes a lot and I remember even virtualization was a hard thing for some folks to grasp you know that was that abstract conversation I remember that took a, a little bit of time for everybody to kind of believe I mean PCI, you know, didn't believe that a virtualized environment could be secure in a PCI fashion originally. They're like, oh no, virtualization can't do it. So, I mean, that that literally is a shift that's taken place in the last 15 years or something. Uh, you know, so I totally understand, Chase, you were bringing up the massive investments in, that's being made and even things that people are open sourcing so that people can be more comfortable with uh, the technology because they know that there's gonna be a big culture shift. Yeah, we see that more and more recently uh, with the uh, the open source community kind of receiving, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a, a gift or contribution, rather contribution of, of really large code sets, code bases that um, I think make the world a better place. The TensorFlow comes to mind, <laughs> yeah. uh, Kubernetes, right? <clears throat> so these are all, these are all large company, um, you know, products that, or I, I should say projects that then get released to the community and the community starts contributing to them. And uh, yeah, to your point, I think that they want to see widespread adoption. They want to see, you know, improvements in competency across the or across the industry, so that <clears throat> it becomes, you know, more and more prevalent, more and more supported, and, and less, you know, of these things kind of going on in the future. Less less security concerns, operational concerns from lack of exposure, lack of experience. What are some of the strengths? I mean, if we're talking, obviously, there are some strengths really from a security perspective. Uh, we talked about, you know, here are the things you got to watch out for governance model and, you know, the different layers and those things. What are, what are, what's inherently secure about containers? Well, so uh, I'll probably take the words out of Chase's mouth. Is containers are not security. You know, security is not containers. <laughs> um, and in as much as they can be a, um, an improvement to your security posture, they can also be a liability, like practically everything else in the IT landscape, right? Um, <clears throat> I think their main strength lies in in uh, isolation, right? If sure. you do it correctly, and that ironically is one of their greater weaknesses too. In that it's a lot more of a concern for a container to to escape, the, you know, have it kernel access, than it is for a virtual machine to you know to get into the the underlying hypervisor. That's that's right. not a concern. Uh, whereas you know in in containerization it is. Uh, but I'll let Chase talk to. To, uh, he's nodding his head like he's got something to say. So I'm like, <laughs> no, I, was, 
I was no, I was absolutely just agreeing with you. Right? They they have a there's they're not necessarily just a container. Oh, I have security because I have a container. Right? Oh, it's isolated. There's these C groups. There's these namespaces. The Linux kernel's great. I'm safe. Right? I think that's a false sense of security. I think people overestimate. And in fact, even when you start to dive into some of these security solutions, there's a question: How do we gather logs on these systems? Right? How do we gather yeah, yeah. these virtual? We've got these virtual networks now living on a host. Right? Before it was just like you got Wireshark. You're capturing packets across the network, you know, you've got a really good forensic analysis, kind of historical understanding of your environment. And now it's like, oh, we've got all these little mini virtual containers that are talking to each other. And by the way, they're also potentially dying every, you know, 12 hours. Yeah. Gone. They can go poof. Yeah. Gone. Exactly. What happened to those logs, right? What happens, what happens if it makes a bad API request? Should I know about that? How many, you know? And so I think that aspect of containers can lull you into a false sense of security. But where I see an advantage of containers is if you're doing them right, since you're just virtualizing these like small microprocesses, these microservices, right? You only should bring what you need. So that helps as well because you're only bringing the you know smallest unit you can so that you really understand the code base and the vulnerabilities and the layers in that, and then you're deploying that. So that's why there's the, ba the best practice around, you know, you have these base images that your developers are allowed to pull and then configure to limit those base images. So you understand what those are, and then you kind of give them more of a sandbox and say, okay, I know where you're starting, and I trust you to go on from there. And so that's kind of the beginning of that conversation. So there's also the, the, the argument of, you know, sort of piecemeal uh, software updates, right, and being able to to modify the software you're using by by changing the container. That you're that you're downloading, not having to you know work on an actual virtual machine, you know pull software off, clean it up, reinstall something new, or spin up a new one. Um, I think that's that's another point. Again, this this goes back to it can be your your best friend or your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. So it, you know you can constrain <clears throat> what developers can pull down, what what their uh, what their base images are, are going to be like, what their yeah, the, the, the sorry the the um, additional services that are being included um, in the build process, but if you don't, you know, that, so you, you basically can improve security outcomes by doing that, or you can leave things wide open, right? To the other point about having all these, um, these microservices talking to each other on a host, typically, you know, TLS or encrypted traffic in between them, even if it's within the host, you lose a lot of that visibility, you know, network visibility. Uh, and this is where I, you know, have been working for, for years with more on the network security side um, is, you know, critical in a traditional sense to understanding what's happening on the network, understanding the security concerns, the the flow of traffic, the you know potential attacks, and so on. Um, when you lose that visibility because you've got an edge firewall or on the edge of the DC, <clears throat> and even if you've got you know the the switches in the data center exporting NetFlow or or you know giving you a tap feed or something of packets, you're not going to see the intra host or intra service, I should say, um, right. traffic. And so that's where the proliferation of new new technologies is, is starting to show up where um, spin, startups are, are doing things like, you know, localized uh, traffic control and inspection by, either via proxy or via being part of the, you know, part of the, the pod itself. Um, and you've got compliance. So not just from the visibility standpoint um, of looking at the network and understanding what's happening there in addition to what you normally would see on your firewalls, your switches, your routers. Um, there's also the behavioral and, and content side of what is that container doing, right? Not just not just what is it saying, talking to, and, and, and where is the traffic going and so on, but, but what's actually running inside of it, right? What versions of, of which software are they? Totally. Do they mm -hmm. have a known CVE associated with them or more than one, right? And, uh, and so on. No, you get to that whole standardization mechanism as well. I mean, it took a really long time for us to kind of come up with the CVE or even, you know, the sticks and taxi and all the other ways that we kind of relate security information in different areas of security. I think it's there's the same aspect that still exists for what you just talked about. And, uh, you know, that's one of those things that emerging technology, usually it's can we do this thing? Then the next thing is, can we secure this thing? And that seems to be how it continues to evolve. And that makes perfect sense. I, from an innovation perspective, you try to do the thing first before you try to secure it. But I think we're still, you know, you brought up a lot of great points of we've got to backpedal. Do we need that visibility? Is that visibility important to our organization? Do we have the ability, if we did have that, to ingest it and, and, and work it into our overall security operations plan and the way that we monitor and 
uh, all of that. It's that again, that's a level of maturity from a security perspective that a lot of organizations are still going for yeah. before containers are introduced. And that's where the demand for new applications, new new services, new technologies is coming from. So you have you have a public or a, a um, public you know develop or I should say open source software that um, you know anyone can download and run, but not everyone can understand. And if you don't have a <laughs> yeah. PhD in it, then it's going to be difficult for you to to you know quote unquote roll your own uh, from a security standpoint to bake in your own security features, your own you know visibility, which I'm sure has been done around the world by by some of these elite teams. The <clears throat> the the deployment you know more more broadly. Um, among people who aren't on that bleeding edge, I think is what is driving the demand. Like we need something that's gonna do all of these things, guys. Yeah. I can't write this myself with my own fork of Kubernetes. You know, I'm, I need something that's gonna plug into this and I, I can call and have enterprise support because I don't know these things and I wanna be able to, to get support from someone who does. So you're seeing that a lot and that's where the, you know, a lot of acquisitions are happening. A lot of um, startups are are here to address. And the CNCF has a, that, um, that uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, Chase? It's like the overview of all the different uh, vendors and technologies that are sort of, they're, you know. Yeah, like, they're big landscape charts we were talking about, where right, it just yeah. shows it's got like, I don't even know how many, but that's where you got that 14 trillion from, right? It shows all these yeah, different yeah. private sector companies investing in. And again, CNCF. that goes back to the, the, year, the, the change on a month to month basis here is, is, is pretty extreme, but there's always new stuff coming out, always new talks, always new technology. So part of, you know, staying up to date is, is engaging with the community. I mean, it'd be interesting even just to see the, take that snapshot today and then a year from now, see how many of yeah. those are still up on that chart, right? How many of them stay on the landscape and how many of them didn't survive incubation? So, or yeah, or got hoovered up by a larger, larger technology right. company. I mean, a lot of folks, I mean, you just talked about a problem that's pervasive regardless of, of the topic is that, you know, the, to integrate a bunch of disparate things into a system that works operationally within your organization is hard. Uh, and that's not typically something that the operations team is good at. You know what I'm saying? It's, that's a, a strategic team or, or, you know, if you have the skill set to operate something here, do you also have the same skill set to integrate and innovate to, for a specific environment? Uh, I think that's a kind of unfair expectation that a lot of organizations have that if we just give or approve the right tech for our org, regardless of what it is, that it's magically going to work to the level that it works in the book that I read about the technology, right? Uh, that's that's tough stuff. And I think there's a big expectation is it, and stuff like this that is, again, really abstract to a lot of folks and way outside of what they do, that this is going to be uh, easy to do once we make the commitment to do it. No, agreed. You're speaking. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree. And that's also you know, that complexity that comes with Kubernetes and big clusters or small clusters is why we see that other layer even now. There's that race to be, okay, well, let me help you run Kubernetes now. Okay. Yeah. Kubernetes is complex. We'll orchestrate be another the layer. orchestration layer. We'll yeah. orchestrate the orchestrator. And that's, yeah, you know, yeah. you'll see the, a lot of cloud vendors right off the bat. They've got their flavor of orchestrate yep. the orchestrator. Yep. If I hear a single pin of glass one more time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I need a single pane of glass for my orchestrators. Yes. Um, no, I, okay. I, that okay. day's yeah. coming, man. I mean, that day's here. But uh, I think it's, yeah. you know, so we've we basically stated the exciting world that we all sit in. So this is exciting. This is game-changingly different mojo here. That's exciting stuff. Uh, we talked about the opportunity. We talked about the investment that the community is doing. If I'm sitting here listening to us talk and I'm thinking, how do I get some of that? How, how do I approach this? What, what advice would you give? I mean, obviously generic advice, not specific to uh, a certain, you know, because obviously what I would do is say, well, what are you doing here? Or what are you doing here? Or what are you doing here? Before I would give advice. But what do you say, Chase? So what, what I would do, and, and this is, you know, kind of how I've been doing it, is you probably have a set of tools you're using in your IT environment right now, right? You maybe have your favorite hypervisor or cloud provider, and they're kind of following this, this idea, they're riding this wave where they see this adoption coming, so they're preparing to be the first in line to help you get there, right? Yeah. So I think you need to start having that conversation with them, you know, well, listen, I'm gonna be refreshing, I might be starting to use your services more and more, or maybe try to use other people's services, start to understand why they're doing what they're doing and changing their environments and potentially how that can help you. 
and just, you know, you know, roll, roll in there, start to look at that and be prepared to be future focused, right? You don't need to necessarily just adopt it all, right? It's like, you know, you can peel away at your current environment, see maybe where you can start to integrate these technologies so that when there is a wider adoption and maybe all of a sudden you're starting to see, oh, this storage virtual machine is now a container virtual machine. Does that matter? Why did you do that? You're part of that conversation. You kind of see where what the value add they had for you, and then you can start to apply that to your environment. So that's, you know, how I would start to approach this. So you can kind of ride the wave with everyone. Is yeah. success in a small place first yeah mm -hmm. i would i would double down on that and say say education and you know it's very very easy and and relatively cheap to to spin up your own little tiny environment if you've already got a data center right and so a lot of these shops that have pretty extensive i you know it infrastructure it's not a lot from a you know from a licensing or barrier of entry standpoint to just get an environment spun up that you can play with you can learn with and and so for IT teams that are trying to get ahead of the game, trying to figure out how to start, you know, having a couple of people on the team who are familiar with it. Maybe they've gone through some training. Maybe they've they've got some hours dedicated per week to uh, to spend on on adoption or on understanding what's happening. Even if you're not actually doing, you know, any containers applications right now, by the time it comes around and you know the director of IT gets a request from some application person in some business line. Uh, to say, uh, you know, hey, we're running this application. We need to buy this application. It's only available by a container. You're not caught with your with your pants down, so to speak. You, you know, you have you're like, oh, good. You know, we have Chase here, for example, and he's he's all up to speed, or at least he's a, you know ready to go and hit the ground running. And you're not going, oh, <laughs> let's go spin up a Kubernetes cluster. I heard that that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're following some step by step on a you know website that now security back to that is a, is a big feature that we've left out of the whole mix. So. Right. Well, guys, it has been fun. And uh, we've got to continue this conversation because there's a lot to talk about. But I super appreciate your expertise and your willingness to join me today and talk about this topic. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Chase. Uh, for welcome. those of you out here who yeah. want to know more about what we do at Insight CDCT, please visit us at insightcdc.com. Thanks and have a good day.